Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we bring you stories of people working to create safer, inclusive, and more ethical communities. In Los Angeles, we see how tens of thousands of buildings are being prepared to withstand the next big earthquake. And in Washington, D.C., we investigate why some LGBTQ veterans are still fighting for honorable discharges. But first, we begin with the disparities between heart disease risk and care. A staggering 60% of African Americans have cardiovascular disease, but only 3% of cardiologists are black. Adriana Diaz looks at how this affects treatment and what's being done to support black doctors. Why don't you have a seat up here? So this is a rare sight. A black patient treated by not only one, but two black doctors, medical resident Dr. Jamarcus Brider and his mentor, cardiologist Dr. Paul Jones. Does it make a difference if your doctor's black? It, to me, it does. He talks to me, and a lot of black people won't go to doctors because they don't have anybody that talk to them. They tell them what to do without asking them how they actually feel. When black patients see black doctors, they're more likely to get preventative care. Though 60% of black Americans have cardiovascular disease, fewer than 3% of cardiologists are black. When black patients see you walk into their room, what's the reaction? Their eyes light up. When Dr. Brider was growing up, his grandfather had congestive heart failure, but didn't trust his doctor. I told him before his passing that I put every effort um, into becoming an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist in order to decrease the burden of cardiovascular disease in our people. Dr. Michelle Albert is the president of the American Heart Association. Why is there so little diversity in cardiology? Structural racism and the fact that um, persons of color have been systematically excluded from being part of the process that enables you to become a doctor in the first place. And Dr. Albert says black trainees have less access to mentors and face racial bias from both colleagues and patients. I walk into a room, they think that I'm the cleaning person. You, the president of the American Heart Association. Yes. One solution, more mentorship. Your engagement here is essential. Like this program by the American College of Cardiology. When you logged on, what did you think? I was amazed. And I want him to do good. His patients are rooting for him too. Now to the Golden State, where older buildings are in a race against time, facing mandatory retrofitting to help withstand major earthquakes. Omar Villafranca shows us the efforts underway to protect residents. This is the cleanup before the earthquake. In Southern California, thousands of buildings like this one are slowly being strengthened to prepare for the next big quake. We'll erect two large, very large steel columns that go into this new, very large foundation system here. Kyle Torje is leading this retrofit. If it shakes, how does it fail? Well, the building essentially pancakes. In the city of Los Angeles alone, there are over 13,000 of these soft story structures. There are also over 1,000 non-ductile concrete buildings, the same kind experts say collapsed after the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. It's reminding me like a picture from a Hiroshima nuclear blast. Structural engineer Kit Miyamoto saw the devastation firsthand in Turkey. This building had no chance at all. Millions of Southern Californians live in areas without retrofit mandates. The city of Los Angeles has one, but the deadline is still decades away. Do you feel that Southern California is on borrowed time when it comes to a big earthquake? That's 100% guarantee. I mean, there would be a gigantic earthquake happening in Southern California. So here in the distance, we see the San Andreas Fault. This is what a magnitude 7.8 earthquake near Los Angeles could look like. It's moving up and down, but it's also moving sideways as these waves are coming through the basin. In 1994, the 6.7 Northridge earthquake struck Los Angeles, killing 57 people and injuring thousands. I am afraid that because the last large earthquake happened long enough ago, we've forgotten about it. We need to bring that to the forefront. For Torje, his crew stayed busy as the race to retrofit continues. It's expensive to do these retrofits, but if you don't have a building left, that's more expensive. If you have tenants that you've lost, that's the biggest loss you can have. 
Coming up, we will introduce you to a rising superstar in the fashion world, catering to a customer base overlooked by much of the industry. That story is next. Welcome back. Designer Brandon Blackwood started his multi-million dollar fashion empire on a whim. Now his designs are showing up across the pop culture landscape. I recently met with Brandon to talk about his rule-breaking approach and his stunning success. His handbags and backpacks seem designed for an already established clothing line, but that was not the case. And for designer Brandon Blackwood, neither was any big plan. I would always say I never want to be a designer because it just seems super stressful and like a lot of work. And How do you feel now? I mean, I was kind of right, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I love this Inca gold. It's really cool. The 31-year-old's Kendrick trunks yeah. and statement coat. <laughs> oh, it has a train. Yes. We do take a lot of things for granted. They found a feverishly loyal customer base. We're going to do a TikTok live that's basically going to show all the trunks. All thanks to social media in the midst of the pandemic. So you guys, this is the bamboo clutch. An account he says he runs all by himself. His viral pop culture moments have struck a chord. It's so fun. And then you see you just want to move around, you want to move your hands. Look at that! <laughs> a far cry from studying neuroscience at Bard College on a full ride. A winter break, spring break during college, I would lie to my parents and say I got a science scholarship. But I was really at like Nylon Magazine in the fashion closet. This is our Elizabeth bag. After um, graduation, he worked at a retail clothing store. You know, retail was my best bet to like get as close as I can to the industry. You know, that's kind of where my first fashion relationships began. His first design, a backpack. I literally went on Google and just wrote handbag manufacturers. And I had no plans on like starting a brand or like selling it. I just wanted to make something for myself. I basically lied to this factory and I was like, yeah, I'm starting a line. I just need a sample. And Wait, there sounds like a lot of deception. There's a learning. lot of deception. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. So many people would continuously stop me. You know, all the editors and stylists I was meeting, I would show them. And they were like, oh, you need to sell this. Like, this is great. Traction, but no access to capital. I had no clue how expensive it was to start a brand. I know like my first order from my factory was maybe like $6,000. I didn't realize like the shipping fees, the shipping fees separately were like another 2000 Walking into those meetings where you're trying to grow the business, mm -hmm. what reaction did you get? I was like mid twenties, walking into like Barney's and like all these stores. It was always the same reaction. It's like, how old are you? But in the summer of 2020, while the world was in lockdown and enraged by the murder of George Floyd, he stamped his many totes with the banner in systemic racism. Everything that was going on during in 2020, I just didn't feel like it was right to make a new collection. Like it felt really like fake. I remember posting it and I didn't expect the reaction that it got. All 500 bags he made sold out instantly. Then he took the chance to slide into the DMs of someone famous who might kick him up to the next level. Almost everyone I reached out to was like, no, we're going to stay away from this. I DMed um, Kim Kardashian, and I didn't expect a response. And like 10 minutes later, and she's like, yeah, send it over. Why do you think it was so controversial, especially at the point of time mm -hmm. that you launched it. I think some people generally just did not want to fight anymore. He's not an overnight sensation. He was building up his brand for that exact moment. Naomi Elizy is an editor at Vogue. For Brandon, basically you can still be exclusive while being attainable. What do you say to that? I think it just shows that there is a market for it. It is about you know, being able to be attainable to these communities that were once excluded from the conversations of what luxury is. 
In 2022, he designed the red carpet look for Cheryl Lee Ralph, who took home her first Emmy in the dress he made just for her. I dropped on the floor and just started crying, and I was like, we're both Jamaican, you know, it's her first win. It's like long overdue, and she looks iconic. It's my first gown. He wants his company to remain financially independent, keeping ownership of his creative licensing. He's gone from backpacks to bags, now clothing. What does that say about his brand? It shows that he is growing but also that he is being intentional and scaling smartly. Gorgeous. Like, For a designer who is re-engineering his take on the fashion industry, it's a strategy that seems to be working. How do you explain having um, the range of customer that you have? Affordability has always been a big deal for you. I think where a lot of new designers messed up is that you know, they'll start these brands, they'll sell like a blouse for like $800, $1,000. And I think that's like the first like start to like your downfall. Price your things for the people that are directly around you, that directly want to see you in and support you. And that's going to be the pricing that sticks. From inclusive fashion to innovative jewelry, many consumers are turning away from natural mine diamonds and choosing lab-grown stones for their sustainability and lower cost. In fact, the lab-created diamond industry is projected to reach nearly $50 billion by the year 2030. Nancy Chen meets a couple who opted for a lab-grown engagement ring. <laughs> yeah. When Eric Nelson proposed to Brittany Drygus, the hardest material on earth had become a little easier to buy. Did you always want to seek out a lab-grown diamond? Frankly, I didn't know what a lab-grown diamond was until a few months before we went shopping for a ring. Demand for lab-grown diamonds has spiked the past few years, driven primarily by younger buyers, attracted to their affordability, sustainability, and traceability. I was turned off just by knowing how some uh, mine diamonds are sourced. So if it wasn't for being a lab-grown diamond, you perhaps would not have gotten a diamond engagement ring. Yeah, I'd probably just get a band. The diamonds can cost up to 50% less. This is where you grow diamonds. Yes, this is our state-of-the-art production facility. Jonathan Levine Miles is an executive at WD Diamonds, a pioneer in the lab-grown diamond industry. You're saying these are very much real diamonds. Yes, correct. I can attest to that, having made them myself. <laughs> the jewels develop in this top secret lab just outside DC from paper thin slices of a diamond blasted with gases and microwaves. And Levine Miles says the results are the same as natural diamonds. Lab grown diamonds are chemically, physically, optically the same as mine diamonds. It's a process that Levine Miles says consumes less energy than mining. These are actually trapezoids. Nelson and Dragas are now married and looking forward to a future together. What does this ring symbolize? It symbolizes us, our relationship, our commitment to one another. And there's a certain ring to that. Ahead, why LGBTQ veterans say they're still suffering decades after a controversial military policy ended. This is Eye on America. It's been more than a decade since the contentious Don't Ask, Don't Tell law was repealed, allowing LGBTQ service members to serve openly. But as the CBS News investigation reveals, many veterans who were forced out of the military are still trying to regain their lost honor and claim benefits. Here's Jim Axelrod with more. The standing ovation in 2011 celebrated noble ideals. No longer will tens of thousands of Americans in uniform be asked to live a lie. As President Obama repealed the policy that had kept gay and lesbian service members closeted and fearful for nearly 18 years. If you put your hand on your hip, if you sit with your legs crossed, like it was always like the witch hunt was always around no matter what during those times in the military. Which explains why vets like Donnie Ray Allen, a former Marine, and Amy Lom, who served in the Navy, were skeptical anything would change. 
both had been kicked out of the military for don't ask, don't tell violations with less than honorable discharges. Did it change your sense of self? Yes, I'm less than. Uh -huh. Less than. Yeah, I'm less than honorable. For Amy and Donnie Ray and many other LGBTQ vets, that meant losing access to the full spectrum of benefits veterans get when honorably discharged, from VA loans to tuition assistance to health care and many federal jobs. It's a dark, it's a very dark place. place. Was any thought given to how we're going to deal with the people who have suffered? To be frank, the focus was on the future. Leon Panetta was the Secretary of Defense who oversaw the repeal almost a dozen years ago. There wasn't a lot of thought about, you know, the people who'd been discharged, who'd gone through hell on this issue, about what do we do about them? And I, in some ways, I regret that. The best estimates are that 14,000 service members were discharged under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Homophobia had chased out many more well before. But the most recent data shows just a little over 1,200 have had this injustice addressed. Which means the overwhelming number of people who were less than honorably discharged for their sexuality still have not had their discharges upgraded. It's like everything else when it comes to civil rights. Um, in order to be able to move forward and embrace the future, uh, you can't just push the past aside. Tell that to Andrew Espinosa, who's not just less than in the eyes of the military. He doesn't exist at all. All right, so this one I was in training still. He was a proud Air Force aviator in the late 80s and early 90s, flying 21 combat missions as a navigator. But in May of 1993, a few months before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was implemented, but in the middle of a debate raging about whether gay people could serve, I don't have anything against gays, but I don't think it should, there's a place in the military. Andrew Espinosa's life changed forever. And they said, well, there's an accusation that there was someone in your room and uh, that you put your hand on his knee and kissed him on the cheek. Just the accusation itself set these wheels in motion that never stopped. The allegation of a kiss on the cheek turned into an indictment for indecent assault and threats from the Air Force. We're bringing you to court-martial. And it's not going to be anything to do with sexuality that you are going to be charged with indecent assault, which is a federal felony. Despite the Air Force admitting homosexuality was a factor in his case, in a letter to Espinosa's mother, he was court-martialed and dishonorably discharged. Captain Espinosa had no health care and no benefits. He couldn't even get hired as a census taker. Is it a stretch in the early 90s to say that what the Air Force was doing wasn't about indecent assault, it was about criminalizing this guy's sexuality? Yeah, I'm sure somebody said, well, Let's use that as the excuse. Veterans like Amy and Donnie Ray have gone through official channels to get the discharge upgrades they need to access the benefits they've earned. But it's been a long and often soul-crushing road. When did you first attempt to get your discharge upgraded? Shoot, back in like 2013 or so. And nothing? Yeah, and it just stalled. I mean, there was just... There didn't feel like there was any hope for anything. And while Donnie Ray finally got his upgrade. Even saying it, like I can't stop smiling because I'm just like, wow, like it actually happened. Andrew Espinosa has given up. I'm just like, OK, we're, we're done. We're done. I'm not going to go beg. And for Leon Panetta, that's a grievous wrong that urgently needs to be made right. In order to be true to what we tried to do by getting rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It's not just about the future. It's also about making sure that we correct the past. In a statement to CBS News, the Pentagon said it has conducted several outreach campaigns for veterans who think they were wrongly discharged. But it did acknowledge 
it has more work to do. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.